mostly fine, albeit cloudier at times, whilst showery rain continues to push in from the northwest. And that's how the weather's shaping up during tomorrow morning. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight, reacting to the big stories of the day, my all-star panel, including historian and author David Aldroyd Bolt and legendary comedy double act The Crankies, Jeanette and Ian Cranky, all live in the studio. My Mark Meets guest is one of the world's leading rock biographers whose latest book, all about the Rolling Stones, makes for explosive reading. Are they the greatest band of all time? Find out at 10 o'clock. And in the big question, should all Brits have a vote on Scottish independence? We'll hear from all sides on that one. And in my big opinion, I'll give my verdict on Boris Johnson's future. How's it going to go? Find out after the headlines with Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Mark. I am Bethany Elsie, here to get you up to date from the GB newsroom. Danish police say several people have been killed in a shooting incident in Copenhagen. The attack took place at the city's Fields shopping centre. A 22-year-old Danish man has been arrested and police say there's no indication there were any other gunmen. The city's police chief says they can't rule out the incident may have been an act of terrorism. Six new allegations of inappropriate behaviour have been made against the former Conservative MP Chris Pincher. Several Sunday newspapers reported he made unwanted advances to male MPs more than a decade ago, accusations he denies. They've emerged just days after he resigned as the Deputy Chief Whip and been suspended from the party for allegedly groping two men. Mr Pincher insists he'll remain an MP, but that he's seeking professional medical support. 
Meanwhile, the Met Police have dropped its investigation into sexual harassment allegations made against the MP Patrick Grady. The force says its officers carried out inquiries, including speaking to the alleged victim, and that no further action will be taken. The MP for Glasgow North resigned from the SNP after police began investigating the incident, which allegedly took place at a pub in 2016. He said he was profoundly sorry after a parliamentary inquiry found he'd acted inappropriately towards an SNP staff member. The British Army have confirmed an investigation is underway after both their Twitter and YouTube accounts were hacked. Their YouTube channel now features videos of, on cryptocurrency and images of billionaire businessman Elon Musk. And their official Twitter account has retweeted a number of posts appearing to show NFTs, which are crypto assets. At least six people have been killed after a glacier collapsed in the Italian Alps amid record high temperatures. Italian media are reporting at least eight people have been injured on the Marmolada Peak in the eastern Dolomites. Local authorities say rescue efforts are underway, with the number of victims expected to rise. Ukrainian forces have been forced to withdraw from the eastern city of Lysychansk after continued Russian aggression. The city was Kyiv's final stronghold in the Luhansk region, which is now entirely captured by Moscow's forces. Meanwhile, it's reported at least six people have been killed by Russian strikes in the city of Slovyansk. The mayor said the attacks, which have caused multiple fires, are the worst to have hit the city yet. The Ukrainian president says the continued bombardment is brutal. And British theatre and film director Peter Brook has died at the age of 97. He directed famous names including Sir Laurence Olivier and Sir John Gilgood at venues such as the Royal Opera House and the Royal Shakespeare Company. Brook was among the first in theatre to focus on diversity in his productions, winning multiple awards across a seven-decade career in the arts. He died in France, where he lived since the 1970s. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Let's get back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight, reacting to the big stories of the day. My all-star panel, including columnist and historian, a good friend of the show, David Aldroyd Bolt. And also, what a treat for you, legendary comedy double act, The Crankies, Jeanette and Ian Cranky, live with us all evening. My Mark Meets guest is one of the world's leading rock biographers, Leslie Ann Jones, whose latest book is all about the Rolling Stones. It makes for explosive reading, sex, drugs and rock and roll, and then some. Are the Stones the greatest band of all time? Just how many people has Mick Jagger slept with? And how is Ronnie Wood still alive? Find out at 10 o'clock. And in the big question, should all Brits have a vote on Scottish independence? We'll hear from all sides on that one. In the news agenda with my brilliant panel, has taxing the rich backfired? Should the government subsidise childcare? And are unisex toilets unfair on women? I want to hear from you throughout the show, mark at gbnews.uk. And this show has a golden rule. Do you know what that rule is? We don't do boring. Not on my watch. I just won't have it. So there you go. A lively couple of hours to come. Big debates, big stories, big guests, and always big opinions. Let's talk about Boris, shall we? Two years ago, Boris Johnson said we've got to send the Covid virus packing. A classic zinger of a line from this gifted wordsmith, but one which reflected what would prove to be a doomed strategy, controlling a highly transmissible respiratory virus. It involved smashing the economy to the tune of half a trillion quid, smashing the NHS by creating a waiting list that some fear will reach 12 million, and smashing young people with school closures and a future ocean of debt. I've credited Boris Johnson for Freedom Day on the 19th of July, which Keir Starmer called reckless. But he can't really claim to be Captain Freedom when it was the holy triumvirate of Lord Frost, Rishi Sunak and Jacob Rees-Mogg 
who convinced him not to cancel Christmas last year. He was about to once again cave in to the sage scientists. That's why in January of this year, that story was exposed by the Mail on Sunday. And that's when I called for Boris to go on this programme. However, since then, I've wanted Boris to prove me wrong. After all, history has taught us you under underestimate this guy at your peril. The man who won the mayoralty twice in Labour-dominated London, who defied the laws of political gravity by winning the votes of lifelong socialists in the Red Wall, and who mercifully got Brexit done. Plus news that he's seeking to tear up the Northern Ireland Protocol, which disgracefully divides our country down the middle, is encouraging. The problem with Boris Johnson is that whilst he is an election-winning machine, he struggles with that bit in between, you know, the running the country bit. The virus was an unknown quantity in March 2020, I'll give you that. But this self-proclaimed libertarian should have pushed back on the doomsday advice from Sage and those wretched modellers who consistently predicted Armageddon. The Covid measures would have been worse under Labour, absolutely. But I'm afraid old Bojo was at the helm guiding Britain through this disastrous experiment of lockdown. He's played a blinder in Ukraine, absolutely. Offering Zelensky moral support, armaments and money. Mark my words, it'll be a lot more expensive for Britain and the world if Putin prevails. But there's a simple reason why Boris Johnson has cooked his goose. He said we've got to send Covid packing. Well, I think it's time to send him packing right now. There's an elephant in the room and it's been there since day one. The question mark about Boris Johnson's fitness to govern. This fiscally and sexually incontinent chancer has spent his whole life getting away with murder and avoiding being found out. He's a serial philanderer with more children than the population of a small African country. Boris Johnson's character, or lack thereof, is what has proved to be his personal downfall and I believe will ultimately be his professional downfall too. He's a gifted guy, hilarious, and has a colossal intellect, which is underrated, and a peerless political instinct. But we have to be honest. This guy, although charismatic and charming, has the ethics of a bullfrog, hopping from one self-inflicted scandal to another. In relation to Partygate, I know he only spent 11 seconds in the company of a birthday cake, and I've got no doubt he worked very hard during the pandemic, and of course, he got ill. But he presided over a number 10 administration in which people were literally carting crate loads of beer and wine into number 10. Number 10, don't forget, one of the great revered public buildings in the world. But behind closed doors, there was drunkenness, debauchery and vomiting. Meanwhile, the health secretary, Matt Hancock, the co-author of our hellish lockdown strategy, was in the health department playing tonsil tennis with a posh bird he went to university with. Did Boris Johnson fire him when the footage was revealed? Of course not. Did he fire Dominic Cummings over the ridiculous Barnard Castle soap opera? No! He indulged him with a bizarre press conference in the Rose Garden of Downing Street. Former great residents of Number 10, Churchill, Attlee and Thatcher, were doubtless collectively rolling in their graves. The problem for this philandering PM is that Britain has become the other woman wanting to believe the promises. He says he'll change. We've got a big future together. But it never happens. He never leaves his metaphorical wife. He just keeps on shagging us. The latest scandal, and there is doubtless more to come, is that it's alleged the Prime Minister was well aware that the Deputy Chief Whip, the unfortunately named Chris Pincher, had previous in terms of inappropriate sexual behaviour. It's becoming clear the Prime Minister knew full well this guy was friskier with his hands than Hugh Hefner, Harvey Weinstein and Mr Tickle put together. Now, I would instinctively stick with Boris Johnson, as I would with any Prime Minister of any political colour who has a huge mandate, in his case, an almost 80-seat majority. But with question marks about posh wallpaper, job requests for his missus and tree houses in Chequers, and with fellow MPs to whom he's answerable sat there in the House of Commons watching porn, the link between this Prime Minister and a culture of chaos and sleaze 
is one which will stick. And that's why he's got a problem. There are scores of Tory voters who have said they will never vote Conservative whilst he is still in charge. And he seems to have torched his relationship with Red Wall voters, who were generous enough to lend him their vote last time round. Just two weeks ago, after a much heralded planned visit up north, he stood them up in favour of a photo op with the aforementioned Zelensky. He's supposed to level up Manchester, not Mariupol. And then there's the economy. As we emerge from the, uh, the biggest economic shock since the Second World War, I would argue self-inflicted, the cost of living is the cost of lockdown, can we really trust a man with the economy who can't even manage his own finances and has to borrow money to decorate his own flat? The papers are reporting today that a Commons committee is investigating the PM's pledge to deliver 40 hospitals by 2030. They're worried it's not affordable. Does Boris care? Well, I'm not so sure. He didn't seem too worried when we spent £34 billion on a failed test and trace system. He seems to have unlimited money for his pals in Ukraine, and it's not clear that he'll have the guts, as Thatcher certainly would have, to face down the unions over their unreasonable and deeply immoral wage demands. It's my view that the millions who supported the blonde bombshell don't rate him anymore, don't trust him anymore, and don't love him anymore. It's the end of the affair. Why does this matter? Why am I calling for his swift dispatch? Because I believe if he stays, our next Prime Minister will be Sir Keir Starmer, presiding over a divisive, Britain-hating coalition, kept afloat by votes from the SNP, hell-bent on destroying the union, the Lib Dems, hell-bent on proportional representation, which means hung parliaments forever, and it could just be that 20 or 30 Corbynite MPs in his own party, Starmer's party, they could hold the balance of power. Credit to Starmer for excavating most of the hard left from his party, but the few that remain could still change the face of this country. Keep Johnson, get Starmer. That's what we're looking at. Britain is going to need five to ten years of tough love because we're in such a mess. Britain is broke and broken just as we were in the late 1970s, once again with inflation spiralling, unmanageable debts and belligerent trade unions. I know she made mistakes, but Margaret Thatcher rescued this country from being the sick and lazy man of Europe to becoming an economic, political, diplomatic and creative powerhouse by 1987. Some of what she did may have been wrong, but let's be honest, most of it worked, which is why so many working class people and Labour voters supported Thatcher three times in a row. Boris was given a similar opportunity in 2019, but he squandered it. In the end, Boris has proved to be no Thatcher and no Churchill. He hasn't got the vision and ideas of Thatcher or the deep moral courage and grit of Churchill. Margaret Thatcher was famous for her three-word slogan in relation to Europe. No, no, no. Well, now I'm afraid to say it's time for Boris to go, go, go. That's my view. What's yours? Mark at gbnews.uk. Are you still backing Boris? Let me know if you are. It's all about opinions on this programme. Reacting to that and much more are my all-star panel of columnist and historian David Aldroyd Bolt, and the brilliant, legendary comedy duo of the Crankies, Jeanette and Ian Cranky. Uh, uh, Jeanette, if I could start with you, has yeah. Boris cooked his goose? Well, we've never met Boris. We know his father very well because we did that television programme for two months with him, didn't we? Uh, oh, what was that show, Jeanette? What was it? The, the Real Marigold to Tell. Brilliant. And, and how did you find Stanley Johnson to be, Jeanette? Fab fabulous. We had a great time with him. Yeah. A lovely man. Yeah. Um, not maybe in uh, the same world as us, <laughs> but still, to, to like, we come from the opposite ends, obviously, coming from working class in, in Scotland, a mining village and a ship building town. He came from the Eaton side, but he was, he, he never, he was just marvellous. He, he didn't have much knowledge of where we came from, though. <laughs> and then well, he did ask me what university we went to, 
learn to be comics. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. Uh, Ian, what do you make of his son? Uh, I was all for him, I must admit. Um, I'm st I still am, in a way. Um, I don't want to see a change in, in the state we're in at the moment, unless it was done pretty quick now. I mean, in my eyes, uh, David Davis should have been the leader anyway, years ago when, we when, when Boris was put in. But it all went kind of wrong, I think, when Cameron took over, when the Eaton boys came back. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, Jeanette, my concern and the essence of my big opinion monologue is that Boris Johnson is, is presiding over an administration which is riven with scandal and sleaze. And I know he's not responsible for groping people in a, in a private members club. He's not responsible for an MP looking at pornography in the chamber. Mm -hmm. But it's on his watch. He's the boss. And it seems to be one gaffe after another. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, we, 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 ne we never found Stanley like that, did we? No, no, he, the he family. Was... He, he, he had quite a lot to say about Boris and being a... But, yeah. What I mean, did he, he say? What did he say about Boris? He is, he, is he proud of Boris, Ian? Yes, yes, he's proud. But he, he, he said he was not a buffoon, but he was larger than life character, and <laughs> uh, and uh, the main boy of the the breed, you know. But when I asked him what he was like growing up, he said, "Well, we sent him to boarding school at age of eight. In fact, we sent all the boys to boarding school when they were eight, and the, the girl went when she was ten. And I said, why didn't you like them? <laughs> and he said, no, what do I know about bringing up children? So that's kind of sums it up. Well, yeah, you have to wonder, is it like father, like son? I mean, the point is, David, and that's the essence of, of my big opinion, is that if you keep Boris Johnson, you're going to get Prime Minister Keir Starmer. You're right. You're absolutely right. And mm. Boris should go now. The problem is mm. that he's a brilliant public figure and he's an absolutely useless administrator. Mm. He's great at going to, uh, going to Ukraine and being on the cameras as just as when he was London Mayor. He was superb at the photo uh, opportunities. He was wonderful when it came to the big announcements. But he has absolutely no grasp of detail, unlike, say, Mrs Thatcher, who slept four hours a night, which probably contributed to her Alzheimer's in later years, but allowed her to concentrate on the detail of every single government department. Mm -hmm. Unlike Winston Churchill, who, although he did not have that depth of detail, still made it his business while leading us in the war and in the 1950s to have a total view of government and to have an idea of where that government was going. Mr Johnson seems to have absolutely no interest in that. And indeed, it's, uh, I think someone once said of Clement Attlee, that he bore the impression of the last man who sat on him. I think Boris Johnson is something of the same from what I've heard from mm. people in and around Downing Street. He agrees with the last man or woman who talks to him. Then someone else comes in with an entirely different idea, usually a contradictory idea. He agrees with that. Mm. He's got no vision or leadership. And he's leading us down a terrible, terrible alley of, uh, of lowering living standards, of soaring inflation. He seems to have no grasp of how to get us out of this. And I fear that you're right that we will end up with Takir Starmer, who undoubtedly, because those people around him are still the Corbynites, you think of Angela Rayner, would lead us down an even darker path. Mm. Now, well, if Boris Johnson doesn't right. go now, mm. or, I mean, in the next you know, few months, I really fear for the next 10 years of this country. Mm. I, I mean, there will be people watching, David, who will accuse us of Boris bashing. Mm -hmm. He still has many supporters out there. And as I mentioned in, in the monologue, you write this guy off at your peril. Uh, what would you say to those that accuse you of Boris bashing? I think I have to refute it by saying that, although I've never been a great supporter of his, I was willing, as many others were in 2019, to give him a chance. Because he did seem mm. like possibly the only man who could both win a, a commanding majority for the Conservatives and get Brexit done by negotiating harder in Europe than Mrs May had been able to do with her team, who didn't really believe that Brexit was what we should be doing as a nation. But we've given him now nearly three years of our time, of our national story, and he has failed. He failed during the pandemic to see that he was being led by people who uh, overestimated, vastly overestimated, the damage that COVID would do to the nation, and in so doing has done vastly more damage to the nation. He has failed in, uh, in his three years nearly as prime minister to enact any conservative policies. I mean, he does a great job of talking about being a conservative, being a libertarian, believing in low taxes, and yet policy after policy after policy could have come from <laughs> Mr Blair or to, from any Labour Prime Minister to the left of him. So um, I fear that we have given him time. We have given mm. him more than enough time, and now it is time to bash him and say, go. Well, Mark, you say 
he failed on taking the advice of the scientists. Who other advice would he take? Well, I think there were many other people around the world of epidemiology. No, but, Say, but Professor they, Carl Henner... You're uh, talking about Oxford. this country. You get it from this country. You well, get your top people here. And they were top people. Nobody knew how this epidemic was going to go. Equally, there were Nobody people... Knew how it was there were many go. other academics in this country who were experts in epidemiology and virology. But nobody many knew of how it was going to go. They program. didn't even know. Well, but, well, Ian, I hear what you're saying in relation to March 2020. You're quite right. We did not know what the virus no, was when what it... What was ahead of us? Right. When it, when it arrived, you're dead right. I think we cut the Prime Minister some slack. He also n nearly lost his life to COVID as well. Yeah. He's been through a lot. But don't forget, almost 100 MPs voted against his uh, third lockdown in Parliament because they were listening to contrarian scientific voices who said the lockdowns aren't working. Um, it's the fact that we had these lockdowns for the best part of two years, Ian, uh, yes. At a time when the country was going through economic hell and this supposedly freedom-loving Conservative Prime Minister was behaving like a communist. We weren't the only country. We were in Australia at the time. We couldn't get back out. It was locked down to that extent. We couldn't move across the border. We live on the border of New South Wales and Queensland. We couldn't walk across that border. There was police and soldiers there to stop you. Now, that's panicking to me. Well, there you go. What's your view, Mark, at gbnews.uk? Do you still back Boris? Will he be the leader of the Conservative Party this time next year? Mark at gbnews.uk. Uh, lots more to get through in the news agenda with my brilliant panel. Has taxing the rich backfired? Should the government subsidise childcare? And are unisex toilets unfair for women? But next, in the big question, should the whole of the UK get to vote on Scotland's future? See you in two. We are GB News. We are right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. A big reaction to my big opinion monologue. I'm saying Boris has got to go. But what do you think, Mark, at gbnews.uk? This from Janice. Mark, my first question to you is, who the hell do you think will be better than Boris? I will support Boris as there is no one else. Please, not Jeremy Hunt. Well, I agree with you on that one, Janice. Janice. Uh, Henry says, Mark, I've had enough of Boris and his corrupt government. As someone who was overjoyed by the huge electoral success of Boris in 2019, I got fed up when I found there's nothing conservative or honourable about Boris. How a so-called freedom-loving libertarian prime minister can implement such devastating, draconian authoritarian lockdown policies akin to communist China and North Korea is beyond me. Henry, great email and beautifully put. David says the channel migrant crisis alone 
should be enough reason to replace Boris with someone with the strength to sort it out. How about this from Paul? Mark, I believe Boris was under so much pressure from the mainstream media, Labour and Sage, that he had no real choice. I'm against lockdowns, by the way, says Paul. Um, look, opinion is divided about this. Uh, for example, Michael says, Mark, I agree with you on most issues, but not on this issue of the Prime Minister. The PM has a mandate for five years from the people and not from you and the media. I voted for Hunt in the Tory party leadership election, but he is a revisionist who's suffering from premature decline. The PM has a woke wife who is responsible for a significant amount of turmoil at number 10. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Um, look, thank you, Michael, for that. Another beautifully uh, well phrased and well put email. I'm with you 100% on this, says Kay. Boris is an egomaniac with no vision and no integrity who loves being prime minister but has no real principles whatsoever. He takes his partner's stance on environmental issues. He was not even that keen on Brexit but opportunistically seized the moment to gain power. The UK is in big trouble at this point in time and we need a serious leader. Please, no more old Etonians or career politicians, that from Kay. Keep them coming in. You know I could do a whole programme just featuring your emails. So mark at gbnews.uk, lots more to get through. It's time now for the big question in which we tackle a major news story of the day. Tonight with Nicola Sturgeon reasserting her desire to hold a second referendum on Scottish independence. Given that a Scottish departure would impact all four nations of the Union, should all Brits have a vote in Indie Ref 2. To debate this, uh, I'll be discussing this issue with my brilliant panellists, uh, the Crankies, Jeanette and Ian Cranky, but also Scottish commentator Stuart Wayton, leader of the Scottish Libertarian Party, Tom Laird, former SNP councillor for Glasgow, Austin Sheridan, and as I said, the Cranky, Cranky's with us shortly as well. Um, if I could start with you, Scottish Wayton, should all Brits have a say in Indie Ref 2? Um, <clears throat> I, I can't see how that would work. Uh, I, I think it would be interesting, actually, because it would encourage the politicians to develop a better, uh, hopefully more populist and progressive sense of Britishness, because I'm not sure how much of that they actually have. But I, I think it's worth making the point about the SNP that they're not really... Uh, independence party in any real sense i think they might have a lot of cosmopolitan nationalism and i suspect they'd like to replace the scottish flag with the rainbow trans flag but in any real sense of independence they don't really believe in it themselves i suspect and i think they would be terrified if they actually became independent and you can see that simply by the nature of the fact that they would want to join the eu straight away um, they don't really have a, a genuine sense of independence and autonomy. They historically as well, it's, I think might have changed it recently, wanted to have the, keep, maintain the queen and the pound. I think they've sort of backed off from that. But I mean, they really are the least independent independence movement in the history of independence movements. And even in terms of when you look at their policies, I mean, what they basically do is they use the public as a stage army. So they shout Scotland and boo Westminster when an election comes. And then once that's gone, they, they introduced all these nanny laws right behind the backs of the public. They never stand an election saying we're going to increase the price of alcohol or you know, make it a hate crime to speak unpleasant words in your own home or you know, all these other uh, uh, bodies. Like they, they introduced the thing called this the named person, which was going to give every parent a state guardian so even in terms of the autonomy of the family the scottish national party are the least freedom loving organization i've ever come across in my life uh well here's the thing austin sheridan former smp councillor for glasgow for scotland to leave the united kingdom will impact all four nations surely they should have some kind of say it will impact all four nations, <clears throat> but just the same way that you know that, that the UK leaving the EU would impact the rest of the EU. I don't think anyone would seriously suggest that the rest of the EU uh, should have had a say on the UK um, voting for Brexit or rather the UK remain. That was a decision for the UK to make. However, there is a, a window 
of opportunity. You know, for the rest of the UK, maybe to look at the constitutional setup to see how, are things working for them. I mean, we, we look at Wales and how they're looking to to expand their their parliament and how they're looking at consciousness no change, we can see the, the, the shift um, in the north of Ireland there. But I think that in England in particular, you know, we've seen some moves towards, you know, decent devolution, maybe uh, if you look at um, Andy Burnham um, in Manchester and how he's used the, the mayoral position there. So it's not just about getting the institutions right, it's about getting the people to lead them properly and to actually make them meaningful. And I think that the key could actually be seeing more devolution within England and I think there's definitely a conversation to be had there but just in relation um, to the previous person's comments and, and everything else that he said could, ser could certainly be valid but you know supporting um, gay rights and trans rights um, certainly doesn't impact on a country's um, status as an independent country and I'm proud as an SNP politician uh, that our party is at the forefront um, of those issues and I'm certainly not ashamed of it uh, would be. you, in Austin? Would, would you include that the the, the rights of five year old children at primary school to choose their own pronoun, pronouns, irrespective of their parents' wishes? Well, I don't think it's for anybody else to choose anyone's pronouns. You know, and, and but but certainly people aren't being encouraged to choose a pronoun at five years old. Essentially, what we're saying is that if a young person. At any age, it doesn't have to be five, it could be younger than five. If, if anyone says that that is the pronoun that they feel, who is, who is it anybody's right to tell them that they know that that's not right? It's certainly, not, it's certainly not up to him, it's not up to me, it's not up to you. Stuart? Well, it's their parents. It's, it's absolutely horrific what's happening at schools at the minute. It's unbelievably patronising to parents that they're essentially, when kids at a very young age, often encouraged through the education, education system itself, decide to change their name and their gender. It's official policy by this government to hide from parents if the child doesn't want the parents to know. So the parents are hidden from this unbelievably important decision that a child is going to make. It's utterly contemptuous. It disorients children. I, I mean, it's so wrong-headed, it's unbelievable. And there's going to be organisations developing in Scotland to oppose this. I can tell, tell you that. But you know now. what? I have, I have to address that issue directly. You know, I'm a gay man, right? And seeing my sexuality, that is my business. And it certainly wouldn't be a school's place to tell my parents my sexuality. That would be for me to decide the right time. And the exact same thing would apply to someone who... If they feel that they're transgender, it's up to them to decide when they tell their parents. It's certainly not the school's what, place to out them. What, what, what? So the schools can encourage the names of they're children being it. changed without without informing the parents. But they're not encouraging. Have, 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 no have you read literature? Whatsoever. Have you read You're the literature and education that's coming out? There is, there is no encouragement whatsoever to tell young people to identify as a different gender. Don't be, you just make yourself look ridiculous. Don't be so daft. Come on, wise enough. Okay. Okay. okay, well, when your, when your kid's primary school in, invites a transgender person called Flo Job to talk to seven-year-olds, you, you can tell me uh, that I'm wrong-headed. What you about... Know, uh, there's what nothing about... wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying that trans is normal, by the way. Let's just let's just get that clear. There's a difference between saying to young people that being trans is normal and encouraging people to be trans, right? Let's just make the distinction there first and foremost. Uh, Aust Austin Sheridan, what about a comedian who who does a naughty stand-up routine like the great Billy Connolly, who could get a visit from the police because he or she has just done a hate crime? Well, I've always been sympathetic towards the comic sector. I mean, especially when it comes to, to historic um, comics and, and historic TV programmes that have been shown. You know, and in my opinion, things like banning Little Britain and stuff like that, OK, I think that that's a step too far. But what I'm saying is that let, let's work within the, the realms of being sensible here. Let's not make it out that, you know, that an education system is encouraging people to be trans. I mean, that's just ridiculous. If we're going to have a conversation about these things, then absolutely let's have the conversation, but, but, but let's have the sensible conversation um, and let's not go with that sensationalist nonsense. But maybe we should get back to talking about the Constitution rather than talking about gender. 
Well, yeah, we did. We got onto that rabbit hole, didn't we? Uh, let's now bring in Tom Laird, if I can, gentlemen, uh, the leader of the Scottish Libertarian Party. Uh, do you think it's appropriate for the home nations to have some input in Scotland's future? Um, not as you frame it like that. Um, I don't think there should be any... Um, I, I think it, your, your, the previous uh, speaker was right when he said you wouldn't expect the European Union, uh, you know, when we left the European Union for other countries in the European Union to decide whether or not we left. That was our decision. So um, I think if you frame it, should England get to decide if it is going to become independent and say to Scotland, well, look, you're not chucking us, love, we're going to chuck you. Um, I think that should be that's perfectly appropriate for England to have its own referendum, whether it gets independence and devolves power away from Westminster, and uh, maybe go down the road as our colleagues in the Libertarian Party UK want of a hit turkey, where uh, Wessex and Essex and uh, all the regions of uh, of uh, England have their own parliaments and own and own assemblies. Uh, yes, um, uh, Tom Laird, apologies, the line is not the best, but um, let me ask you uh, whether, we, to a degree. The United Kingdom, Kingdom does have input on, on IndyRef2 because it's the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who at the moment will not grant one. Well, I think we had this referendum in 2014 and the answer was no. I don't think it's time for another referendum. Stuart Wayton was absolutely correct. Um, there's The SNP are posturing here. They're posturing and they are playing games. And really, at the end of the day, this referendum is another referendum on, on the EU, is exactly what it is. It's got nothing to do with Scottish independence. The SNP in Scotland enjoy the fact that they have power, but no accountability. And they can, uh, they can always blame Westminster for their poor performance. OK, well, uh, we'll uh, try to work on your line, Tom, because we want to hear from you. Austin and, um, I'm pleased to say, uh, Stuart, I'll come back to you shortly. But with me in the studio are the iconic Scottish double act of the Crankies, Jeanette and Ian Cranky. Um, Jeanette, let me ask you about this. Uh, what are your feelings about Scottish independence, Jeanette? Oh, not at all. <laughs> Not at all. We've never lived there for years, and but it still wouldn't. Run. And it's it's. Can, Nick, can I just say Nicola Sturgeon? <laughs> can the Scottish nationalist chappy ask me why will they not allow Scots people who now live in England a vote? Because a lot of Scottish people moved like ourselves to get work in the 60s. There was no work for us. And you fob, you may want to go back one day, and you don't want to go back to a country you don't recognise, do you? Well, that's a great question. Uh, do you care to answer that, uh, yeah. Austin Sheridan? Yeah. Why, why can't expat Scots have a vote on independence? Uh, because the whole point about having the referendum and, and, and elections in, in general for the Scottish Parliament and for local elections <laughs> is, is people who live here, um, you know, that do get people live here who pay taxes out so they get to decide the future of the country. If I so choose to move from Scotland and I move to, to, to down south or, or anywhere else, I would, I would get to vote and shape, um, you know, their national picture and vote in their referendums. Uh, so it is just a case of it's it's not about where you come from, it's about where we're going together. Uh, but I would certainly encourage the you know the crankies. We're always we're always looking for talent to return to Scotland. Uh, maybe you could you could start residing here again come twenty twenty three, and then you'll absolutely have your say in Scotland's constitutional well, future. <laughs> not not if you lot are running it. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, 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 why are you against an independent <laughs> Scotland? Why? Mm. Well, I don't. I don't live there. No. And and I, you know, I just get called Nicola Sturgeon all the time. And <laughs> she called the wee cranky. She, that call... could be your next character, Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> you can make a fortune. How about you, Ian? Why why do you not support independence? Surely it's the destiny of the Scottish people to be free. Well, they are free. Come on. Well, that's 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 a term they they've sort of taken from Braveheart. In fact, this whole thing got a hand since Braveheart, which, by the way, was historically wrong. The main thing I would go against is it would be split up from the Crown, and I don't want to see that. And I think you would have colossal problems in Scotland if they split from the Crown and said we don't want the royal family. Because you've got a lot of royalists up there, you know. 
a lot. I mean, yes, Austin Sheridan, uh, there would be major economic implications for the union if Scotland leaves, but it's pretty clear that the biggest loser will be Scotland themselves. No, I'm not entirely sure um, how we can say that that's the case. But it does, that does all depend on who governs Scotland after, you know, a post-independence. But certainly, if you look at the latest paper that, that was released um, by the Scottish government, it, it looked at comparator countries, you know, of similar size to Scotland, and looking at, at how they outperform uh, the rest of the UK. But I think, you know, Mark, um, that you actually put the argument for, for independence quite right when you were talking about the, the leadership of the country under Boris Johnson, mis, um, mismanagement of the economy, uh, you know, what were guaranteed, uh, you know, as no growth. Um, these are all things that, that we know that, that, that are guaranteed as remaining part of the UK. And at the end of the day, what we need um, is to allow this, is to allow Scotland to have the debate. And, you know, I, I, I was on the Political Correction show this morning with Arlene Foster uh, discussing this very issue. And, you know, what this is actually about is, is democracy and Scotland's democratic group to having a referendum. And at the moment, that's something that's been blocked, but it's the only unionist argument at the moment. What we want to see them is, is moving on to the substance of the debate and seeing if they can put a positive case forward for remaining partly in Westminster and remaining under Boris Johnson's government. Oh, well, listen, you've been on GB News more than I have, Austin, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> Mark, can I just ask him a question? Ian. How can the SNP think they can run a country when they've got the highest drug rate in Europe, possibly in the world, the hospitals are collapsing, the schools' the standards have dropped, everything's gone wrong. You've got two ferries that are not even finished. Uh, they started off at 69 million and 290, I think, million now. And they painted the windows on them because they weren't even finished when you were showing people them. What kind of government would that be? How can you run a country? <laughs> No, well, we don't think we can run the country. I mean, we have been doing it for the past 15 years, to be fair. Yeah, badly. I mean, you agree. badly. The things that have happened or not, <laughs> regardless. And, and then the people have continuously voted. In fact, the last election, we got the highest share the SNP ever got. But you raised some really important issues, so things like our health service. Absolutely. I don't think there's any health service in, in, in the world at the moment uh, that is running perfectly um, after COVID. Try Australia, mate. We, we, we absolutely do. Uh, have to make efforts, uh, you know, to get things improved there. Um, in terms of the ferries, absolutely. Um, and I think that there's been no denial that there's been major mistakes been made there. And you know what? It's, I, 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 I think that when a government does make a mistake, that it is key that they own up to it and key that they then have a plan to fix it. But unlike Boris Johnson, who just buries his head in the sand and takes the public for fools. That's so when is, when is Mrs Sturgeon, Mrs Sturgeon going to own up to and our Boris mistakes? Johnson, and Boris Johnson, who was partying in number 10 down the street when people couldn't go and see their relatives that were dying, he didn't just take the public for fools. He just showed them utter contempt and it's disgraceful. And he should absolutely be designing immediately. But see if he does... I think you were the health secretary, if I remember right, that travelled up and down in the train to London. If Boris Johnson doesn't resign, right, he's the SNP's biggest asset in this independence referendum campaign. And I'm, I'm putting that out there right now. Because while he remains in office, I'm telling you, there is no positive case for the union while he remains Prime Minister, I can assure you. OK, well, look, uh, let's close, uh, close up this discussion. Stuart Wayton, uh, do you think that the Prime Minister will grant the Scots a new referendum in the next few years? And if so, what would the result be? Uh, no, I don't think he will. Uh, if he did... The independence, uh, the SNP would lose again. Although you could say they win again because it doesn't matter because they just want this to go on. Because essentially, the, the Scottish nationalism, uh, national discussion avoids politics. So all the points that were raised there, absolutely right in terms of the hospitals, education in particular is my concern. Terrible, terrible decline of Scottish education. But these things, when it comes to elections, they get away with it by just waving the flag, having cheap Tory chants, and getting what is essentially a kind of disillusioned vote again and again and again. And it's, it's destroying politics in Scotland. OK, well, I'm pretty sure that Austin thinks that Scotland would choose independence <laughs> in a referendum. 
Uh, the the no, Crankies I would, I would also, so, also uh, would take the opposite view that uh, Scotland would uh, choose to stay. Uh, that is the view uh, as we've established there uh, from Stuart as well. Uh, Tom Laird, finally from you, what about an idea which is to lance the boil, call Nicola Sturgeon's bluff, grant Scotland a referendum which the SNP lose? <laughs> Well, let's hope that they do, uh, if you can hear me. Let's hope that they do lose that election. Um, but I don't think you've, you've heard the last thing. This is a never end them. This will just keep continuing. Scotland will only become independent when Scottish people care more about freedom than they care about free stuff. That's the end. Um, my profound thanks to all of the contributors to this discussion. Senior lecturer at Abate University, Stuart Wayton, who's done research into the changing nature of politics. The leader of the Scottish Libertarian Party, Tom Laird. GB News favourite, former SNP councillor for Glasgow, <laughs> Austin Sheridan. And, of course, the Crankies, okay. who stay with me for more panel chat. And next up in the news agenda with my panel, has taxing the rich backfired? We'll discuss that next. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. What is the likelihood of a Scottish independence referendum, a sequel, Indie Ref 2? Uh, a bit of satire from Christine, who says, Hi, Mark, the Scots that don't want independence can always move to England. We accept all immigrants, whatever their reason for coming here. Uh, there you go, bringing two stories together. Nicely done, Christine. Uh, we also have this from uh, Alex. The SNP and its supporters always use whataboutism when their party comes under criticism. So... Predictable. Uh, your guest, Austin, has been twisting and turning so much, it's amazing that he hasn't turned himself inside out. Time and again, he lies and lies. That's from uh, Peter. Not too much support for the SNP at the moment. Um, how about this from Arnold? Mark, why do the Scottish nationalists never answer a straight question and slag off Boris any chance they get to avoid answering the question? I thought they got a great grilling there from the brilliant uh, Ian Cranky, who's with us. Um, Mark says, George, I love Neil Oliver. I love the Crankies. I love Tunnocks. But England needs to be free now. There you go. <laughs> Perhaps that's the next big question. Should England have an independence referendum? What about Wales? What about Northern Ireland? Well, yeah. So uh, we'll get to that, I'm sure, on a future occasion. But Britain is facing an exodus of its richest individuals because of Tory tax raids. According to new data, in the last five years, 
Britain has lost 12,000 wealthy individuals, mm. which it classifies as having just under a million pounds in cash and assets. According to the report, another 1,500 are expected to leave this year. Experts are blaming the surge in inheritance tax bills and repeated raids by the Tory government. With spiralling costs, there have been more calls to tax the rich, but is it potentially driving out some of the largest contributors to our GDP? Has taxing the rich backfired? David. Of course it does. It always backfires. Um, we were talking at the beginning of the show about Peter Brook, the film director, who went to live in France in the 1970s because of punitive tax rates, as did the Rolling Stones. David Niven went to Switzerland. Now, the, the, if you look at the, uh, the exodus in the 1970s of all of the great British creative talent, it was directly because they were being penalised by, I think it was 87% tax rates on earned income and 98% on unearned income. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this idea that, that someone with a million pounds is rich, one in four people in this country has assets of... Well, sorry, one in four over 60s in this country has assets worth a million pounds because oh. of the increase in house prices over the year. <laughs> yeah. So we're not talking about this sort of elite stratum. No, a yeah. lot of these people haven't got a pot to piss no. in, but they live in a house that they own. Exactly. Yeah. And their children are going to be penalised because of inflationary pressures and because governments over the past 30 years have found it easier to ramp up house prices... Uh, you know, asset prices have gone up enormously since the time of Mr Blair, than they have to create a well-paying economy. So this is just governments penalising people for the policies of earlier governments. It's totally unfair. Well, Jeanette Cranky, I'm not delighted that we live in an unequal world, OK? No. It's very sad that there are multimillionaires yeah. and people on the streets. Yeah. But we, we have a capitalist system, which is probably the best system we've ever had yeah. uh, with which to run <laughs> society, right? It's mm. the least bad, shall we call it that, yes. compared to communism and all yeah. the rest of it. Uh, the issue we've got is that it's a great headline, isn't it? We're going to tax the rich. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that rich people are mobile. They can go somewhere else. Of course. Of course they I can. mean, for example, you guys. We've you made your millions. <laughs> we've never lived there. We've never, we've never owned property there. Where? In Scotland. Oh, no, no, I'm talking about, yeah. Generally. I mean, you know, what are your thoughts about this, this idea of wealthy people paying more tax? Because on paper, it sounds like a good idea. Mm. We always have paid more tax, wealthy people, haven't we? Uh, well, wealthy people always have paid Because they, they make more rate. money and it's a higher yeah. tax rate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, it appears to... It's a great headline, but it appears to have backfired because what it's going to do is it's going to cost the economy. I always give this example. Yeah. Mm. A, a brand-new Rolls-Royce will, will uh, generate something like £50,000 in VAT yes. for the Treasury. Uh, but now what's going to happen is those rich people who we're so happy to condemn and Walmart. attack will just buy their Rolls-Royces somewhere else. Yeah, in Dubai. Yeah. yeah. No, it's... You know, so, so it, it, it just doesn't work. Does well, it? it ends up costing British jobs because if the amount of Rolls Royces sold declines here, well, then the showrooms close down because you don't need a showroom if nobody's buying them, and they might decrease production. Um, the rich are already paying a huge amount of tax. The top 1% of taxpayers contribute 28% of the entire tax yield, and that's going up every year. So the best part of a third of tax comes from 1% of the population. And if you expand that to the top 10%, of uh, taxpayers in this country, it's something like th uh, three quarters of all of the tax paid in the country is from 10%. So, uh, I mean, how much more are people going to be expected to contribute? Mm -hmm. Because these are not just people who are rich because God has ordained it that they be rich and that other people be poor. These are people, on the whole, who are rich because they've created successful businesses yeah. and they've employed people who have been yeah. able to live good lives because of that employment. Mm -hmm. Think of someone like James Dyson, for instance, who's made the world a better place and, in doing so, has become rich. But then a great many people have been employed and their families have been looked after because they've been able to work for this man who was in, in, intelligent. In, including over a 1,000 engineers. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the, the, this idea that the rich should be penalised because they've been successful, um, it's never been successful. That, as a policy, has never been successful wherever it's tried. Because, as you say, they're mobile. They'll go to Switzerland. They'll go to Dubai. They'll go to America. They'll go wherever they can because they can. And with technology, uh, yeah. they're more mobile than yeah. ever. And all, yeah. all it will do is end up costing this country in terms of lower tax yields, therefore worse public services and fewer jobs. Well, Jeremy Corbyn mocked Boris Johnson at the dispatch box when he was leader of the opposition. He said, you're trying to turn Britain into a tax haven, Singapore on sea, mm -hmm. right? I thought, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's make Britain Singapore on sea. Let's attract yeah. billionaires from all around the world yeah, and they precisely. can spend their money here, yeah. Ian. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Mark was right. I remember in the 70s, we were working in the 70s, when that drain came. It yeah. was Wilson that did it. Yeah. It was, and it actually, uh, I think it was Humberdick mentioned that by the time he'd paid the national insurance stamp and the tax, he owed them tens. Yeah. 
He was paying to yeah. go to work. Crazy. So you're right. Jeanette, do we have a problem with rich people in this country? Did you ever face jealousy when you became successful? Not really. No. No, no. no I, but I didn't. do you not think becoming rich is, is, is something that's frowned upon, yeah. as opposed to in America where it's celebrated? It. Yeah. But we've never, we've never exploited that by mm. it, being outrageous. It, being outrageous I mean, or, you know. I think What's well, the most extravagant thing you've bought, Jeanette? A boat. Well, we had a boat. <laughs> Really? A Grand Banks, Little yeah. Cranky's yacht? No, no it was it's a, big a Grand, Grand Banks. Banks. Nice. Uh, in those days, it was 90,000 quid's worth. So it was a fair, a fair However, few quid. However, yeah. I did sell it for 124. There you go. Yeah. Made a profit. the entrepreneur. Eight years later. There you go. The Crankies. <laughs> what a pair of oligarchs. <laughs> uh, brilliant stuff. Well, look, I think you'll agree we are travelling first class on the high seas with our panel tonight. So brilliant. <laughs> Have David, Jeanette and Ian with us. Lots more to get through in our news agenda. Look at this. Uh, Miss Garner's put a lovely list for me together, including should the government subsidise childcare? We'll discuss that in the next hour. Are unisex toilets unfair on women? Plus, we've got the papers live at 10.30. But next, I'll be dealing with Joe Biden in another mini monologue, my take at 10, and a new book all about the Rolling Stones, Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll. Don't go anywhere. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. It's 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan. Tonight, my Mark Meets guest is Leslie Ann Jones, one of the world's leading rock biographers, whose latest book is an absolute corker. It's all about the Rolling Stones. It's explosive in its revelations. Are they the greatest band of all time? We'll talk sex, drugs and rock and roll in just a few minutes' time. How many people has old Mick Jagger slept with? Surely not as many as Ian Cranky. In the news agenda, with my brilliant panel that features Ian and Jeanette Cranky and David Aldroyd Bolt, uh, we'll be asking, should the government subsidise childcare and are unisex toilets unfair on women? What do you think about a unisex loo? Should it be boys and girls or do we bring it all together? Also, tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30 with full panel reaction. And after this, my take at 10. I'll be dealing with America and Joe Biden, and I'm not pulling my punches. First, the headlines with Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Mark. I am Bethany Elsie, here to get you up to date from the GB newsroom. Danish police say several people have been killed in a shooting incident in Copenhagen. The attack took place at the city's Fields shopping centre. A 22-year-old Danish man has been arrested and police say there's no indication there were any other gunmen. The city's police chief says they can't rule out the incident might have been an act of terrorism. 
Six new allegations of inappropriate behaviour have been made against the former Conservative MP, Chris Pincher. Several Sunday newspapers report that he made unwanted advances to male MPs more than a decade ago, accusations he denies. They've emerged just days after he resigned as the Deputy Chief Whip of the Conservative Party and he was also suspended from the party for allegedly groping two men. Mr Pincher says he's seeking professional medical support. The Met Police have dropped its investigation into sexual harassment allegations made against the MP Patrick Grady. The force says its officers carried out inquiries, including speaking to the alleged victim, and that no further action will be taken. The MP for Glasgow North resigned from the SNP party after police began investigating the incident, which allegedly took place at a pub in 2016. Ukraine's president has accepted his troops have been forced to withdraw from Lysychansk, but vows to restore control to the city. Vladimir Zelensky says although the area has been lost to Russia, his forces would return using army tactics and modern weapons. The eastern city was Kyiv's final stronghold in the Luhansk region, which is now entirely captured by Moscow. At least six people have been killed after a glacier collapsed in the Italian Alps amid record high temperatures. Italian media are reporting at least eight people have been injured on the Marmolada Peak in eastern Dolomites. Local authorities say rescue efforts are underway with the number of victims expected to rise. The British Army has confirmed an investigation is underway after both their Twitter and YouTube accounts were hacked. Their YouTube channel now features videos on cryptocurrency and images of billionaire businessman Elon Musk. And their official Twitter account has retweeted a number of posts appearing to relate to NFTs, which are crypto assets. And Britain's Cameron Norrie has reached his first Grand Slam quarterfinal with straight set wins at Wimbledon today. But Heather Watson has been knocked out in her fourth round. Both matches and others were played on the middle Sunday of the tournament. That's the first time it's ever been played in Wimbledon's history. And famous names have been celebrating 100 years of action on centre court with Roger Federer making a speech and Sir Cliff Richard singing a live rendition of Summer Holiday. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Let's get back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Big stories, big guests and big opinions. In just a moment, my Mark Meets guest is Leslie Ann Jones, one of the world's leading rock biographers. She's written books on Bowie, on Freddie Mercury, and John Lennon. Well, her latest is all about the Rolling Stones. It makes for explosive reading. Are they the greatest band of all time? Sex, drugs and rock and roll are coming your way. In the news agenda with my panel, has taxing the rich backfired is a topic that we're going to continue to discuss in this hour. Also, should the government subsidise childcare and are unisex toilets unfair on women? Plus, another topical game show and tomorrow's papers at 10.30 sharp. With full panel reaction tonight, historian and political commentator David Aldroyd Bolt and comedy legends The Crankies, Jeanette and Ian Cranky. But first, it's time for my take at 10. Tomorrow is the 4th of July, a special day in which America celebrates its hard-won independence. Now, I'd love it if we still owned them, but you can't win them all. This annual celebration is tinged with sadness these days as this once great nation appears to again be navigating towards civil war. The whole country is split between left and right, pro-gun, anti-gun, pro-life, pro-choice, woke and non-woke. The list goes on and their current president, Joe Biden, or slow-mo Joe as I like to call him, is an absolute disaster. Having made a dog's dinner of the Afghanistan withdrawal, Increasing tensions with Russia by accidentally saying he wanted regime change in Moscow and printing so much money, America is now in an inflation spiral which looks impossible to escape. Deeply flawed human being though he is, I would take the orange one, Donald Trump, over Biden all day long. But doesn't America deserve better than either of these two? 
I think Governor DeSantis of Florida, who stands for individual freedom, is a good option. So ably demonstrated his love of freedom during the pandemic when his light touch measures produced better outcomes than lockdown loving California. And the state of Florida has seen an influx of Californians and others relocating because Florida appears to be the only place that still embodies American values, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Remember that famous line from Ronald Reagan. He said the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. America is in trouble, if we're honest, with eye-watering gargantuan amounts of national debt. The Yanks have been living high on the hog for too long now, borrowing their way to prosperity, getting more obese, lazy and woke by the day. Even their military, once the best in the world and still the largest, is now obsessed with the pronouns of its soldiers. Great news for the enemy, who don't care whether they're killing he, him or she, her. America has dined out on the dollar being the go-to global currency, placing them at huge strategic economic advantage. But that's not a given forever, and I fear a day of financial reckoning will come sooner rather than later. Their democracy is in crisis too. No one believes election results anymore. Republicans questioned the validity of 2020, just as the Democrats questioned 2016. There's a whiff of scandal and corruption around so many previous candidates. Donald is no angel. January the 6th was a disgrace. Hillary Clinton and those emails. And Biden and his son Hunter, with the most notorious laptop since the one Gary Glitter took to be repaired at PC World. But those gloating at America's problems should be careful what they wish for. How do you like the idea of a totalitarian dictatorship that tortures its own people and controls its population with cameras and tracking technology, becoming the world's predominant economic superpower? Just imagine what life would be like in the West with China calling the shots. Left or right, Republican or Democrat, red or blue, I don't care who does it, but it is time to make America great again. As Putin rampages across UK, Ukraine and as the president of China circles a sharpened pencil around a map of Taiwan, the very foundations of the free world are under threat. If the US win, we all win and failure is not an option. Happy Independence Day. May God bless America and may God help them too. It's time now for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, showbiz, journalism, sport and beyond. Tonight, Leslie Ann Jones, broadcaster, novelist, keynote speaker, ex-Fleet Street journalist and one of the most respected rock biographers in the world. As the best-selling author of Who Killed John Lennon? The Lives, Loves and Death of the Greatest Rock Star, Bohemian Rhapsody, the definitive biography of Freddie Mercury, plus a follow-up, Freddie in Love, and with best-selling books, on her childhood friend, David Bowie, and Mark Bolan, no relative, Leslie Ann was well-placed to pen the definitive portrait of the Rolling Stones. And here's the book, an absolute must-read, The Stone Age, there it is, 60 years of the Rolling Stones. So are they the best band in the world? Are they the greatest band ever? And how have they managed to keep going after all these years? And what is their musical and cultural legacy? All of this and much more is answered in the Stone Age. And I'm delighted to say that Leslie Ann Jones joins me now. Hi, Leslie Ann. How are you? Very well. Congratulations on the publication of the book, Rave Reviews. Thank you. Why did you choose the Stones for this weighty tome? Kind of chose me, really. This 60th anniversary was approaching. I have three young adult children, and we talk a lot about music. And it was obvious to me that they knew next to nothing about this band, about their history, about the cast of hundreds, if not thousands, who passed through their lives and careers, who no longer exist in some cases, long forgotten, uh, the many victims, the wives, the children, the girlfriends, the, the people who've fallen by the wayside. And I felt the story needed retelling, bringing back all those people to life. For sure. How did the band come about? Mick and Keith were at school together uh, in Dartford. Uh, when they were obviously very young, so, so primary school. Brian Jones, meanwhile, emerged from Cheltenham. He was involved in the jazz scene down there. 
And they gelled in London. Everybody made their way to London to, to make their fortune, if you like, and found each other. And it was very much Brian's band to begin mm. with. Although when they stopped being a covers band and began to write their own songs, primarily because their second manager, Andrew Lou Goldham, made them, he said, you can't go on recording or playing other people's music forever. And the myth goes that they sh he shot them in a kitchen until they came up with some songs. Brian didn't write. Brian probably felt inhibited by the power of Mick and Keith as songwriters. Mm. They were virtually brothers. And so they were able to bring this chemistry that they had for many, many years into the creation of songs. Well, you saw that, didn't you, in the Beatles documentary, Get Back, where George and to a greater extent Ringo slightly out to sea because the real power dynamic in the Beatles was Lennon and McCartney. So you'd argue it's the same Richards and Jagger. It pretty much is, yeah. Mm. And uh, they, once they understood their power, their songwriting power, there was no stopping them. Mm. And Mick is um, an undersung lyricist, if you like. I think most people don't recognize him for, for his ability as a lyricist. Keith is obviously the human riff who would come up with melodies and um, the little tricks of the trade. And those things put together make the magic. And what's unique about your book is it's not a sort of blokey rock biography. You mentioned to me before we came on air that you very much wanted to write it, uh, obviously, as, a, as an, a very accomplished journalist and biographer, but as a woman as well. And you've, you've sort of written about the sort of the emotional impact of their behaviour over the years. That is always my approach. The vast majority of rock biographies are written by male rock writers who had posters of these, of these guys on the walls when they were kids and wanted to grow up to be them. Uh, my approach is not that. I'm more interested in the psychology of these people, the emotions, the relationships, uh, their children, that kind of thing. Because all of that builds the personality behind the rock star, behind the celebrity. Well, to what extent was sex a motivating factor for these young men, particularly Mick? I think rock is sex. It's liberation that we see when we go and watch a band like the Rolling Stones. There's something primeval, something almost bestial that comes out, which the vast majority of people at a rock gig are observing, but they're not behaving that way, but they're, they are witnessing uh, how it could be, what it could be like if they were them up there on stage. Obviously, it's not very much about sex when you're nearly 80, um, which this lineup, you know, they're all pushing 80 now, aren't they? So I think that's sort of not really their agenda. It's more sex and drugs and sausage rolls nowadays. Yeah, it probably is. I mean, Jagger, notorious for his his appetite, sexual appetite over the years. Yeah, and, and reptilian about it. You know, it was all about the pursuit for Mick, that he would chase somebody until she caught him, but then he would quickly lose interest and move on to the next. Um, very disloyal, uh, not faithful, and hasn't honored his families or the women he's been involved with. He was with Jerry Hall, for example, for 21 years. They had four children together. But once he had a child with somebody else and she said enough's enough, he divorced her and it was worse than that because it turned out they were never legally married in the first place. So he turned those four children into bastards overnight, which was a very dishonorable thing to do. So d does he emerge from the book as, as a, a less than nice guy? I would say not very nice, but we have to acknowledge his talent. We have to acknowledge the success of this band, the greatest rock and roll brand in the world, which is what they turned themselves into. The music business changed a great deal in the 80s, largely as a result of Live Aid, because the money men looked and they saw what there was to be made. And it changed, it turned a corner, in much the same way as professional football did. So suddenly it's corporate and suddenly it's all about the juggernaut and it's about the big stadium gigs and it's about massive money, television as well. And that was perfect for the Stones. They didn't need to be in the charts at a certain point. They could just go around the world rocking and rolling for, for decades, which is exactly what's happened. And they reached a point where their music crystallised to the point that we are not used, we're not accustomed to new Rolling Stones music. Mm. They're... they're catalog, if you like, the songs that we know are ancient. And yet those are the songs they play. You're not going to get very many new numbers at a Stones concert because they're delivering what the audience came to hear, which the same thing if you go to a wedding reception, 
you know... So they've become a covers band of their own music, They perhaps. pretty much have, yeah, they're their own tribute band. And there's only two-fifths of them left of the original mm. lineup. But you go to a wedding, the DJ comes on, you know, put on Satisfaction, Honky Tonk Women, Brown Sugar, and all age groups will get up and dance to those songs. Would you say that the creative well pretty much dried up by the mid-70s? What was, was there a natural cut-off when they, because I know about Elton John and his particular golden era was sort of 70 to 75, 76. Uh, did they have a particular window? Large swathes of the 80s consisted of Mick and Keith not really talking to each other, which is why they didn't perform together at Live Aid. Mm. They did perform, but Mick was in a, you probably remember Dancing in the Streets with David Bowie, yes. the video, and then Ronnie and Keith were on stage in Philadelphia with Bob Dylan performing horribly badly, but they weren't together. But some tremendous Stones music came out of the 80s. The downside was that Mick was never able to launch himself yet credibly as a solo artist. Unlike McCartney post-Beatles. Unlike McCartney post-Beatles. And having watched Mac Eric Glasto, which I think pretty much the whole country must have done, either on television or live, I saw into the future and I could see McCartney sanctified by that performance. And the Stones were playing the same night. And they would have been disgruntled because the attention that McCartney got, the adulation, he will go down in history for that one performance at the age of 80. And the Stones can't touch him. Because what, what the uh, the concert, was it Hyde Park that the Stones yeah. were performing at? And, that, that, and tonight. Uh, uh, there you go. A successful commercial event sold out. Uh, McCartney at Glastonbury, a cultural moment. It was a seminal moment. It was a very moving moment. Because it doesn't matter to him that his voice has declined, that it doesn't have the strength. It's fairly weak now, but he can still hit the notes. Yeah. He'll still get up on the plinth with an acoustic guitar and bash out Blue, uh, Blackbird, in fact, not Bluebird, that's another one of his songs, Blackbird, and then his song, a tribute to John Lennon, which was here today, so moving and had everybody in tears. And I can't remember ever having been in tears watching Mick Jagger live. Uh, you'll have watched it. You watched the McCartney performance at Glastonbury and he spoke very affectionately about John, uh, who, of course, is a subject of another of your biographies. And, and John would have been very touched by what he had to say. And, and the, I know it was a very troubled relationship they had, but that was a very special moment, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, John, depending on what mood he was in at the time, would have either scoffed at it and shrugged it off, or he would have allowed himself to be moved by it. But he was somebody who couldn't express emotion very well because he was quite stunted from a very young age. Um, the thing he and Paul had primarily in common was they both lost their mothers when they were very young boys. So that bonded them from early on. Um, you can't say the same about Mick and Keith, who both had strong relationships with their mothers uh, in quite a long way into to their adulthood. So they had that, that backbone, if you like. It does make a difference. And what about their enduring popularity? I mean, you said that, you know, sadly, you know, the band is not uh, complete anymore, but they are still, I mean, when people go to see the Stones, they, they say, even now, it's the best gig they've ever been to. I mean, they, they are the best live rock band on the planet, aren't they, even today? Yeah, last time I saw them live was in Twickenham in 2018. Um, they'd lost it a bit for me by then. And Charlie Watts, was, of course, was still mm. with them. There is a school of thought now that the Stones without Charlie are not really the Rolling Stones. Mm. There was speculation that they would break up after his sad death, but yeah, it didn't happen. Yeah, but that's happen. how they've kept going. And, and mm. I was asked the other day, what's the secret of their longevity? The secret of their longevity is their longevity. The fact that every time somebody dies, as in the case of Brian Jones, immediately replaced with Mick Taylor. Then Mick Taylor decided to leave, so in comes Ronnie. It's a, it's uh, a business and It a is a business. And Bill Wyman, you know, did he jump or was he pushed? But in comes Daryl Jones, who's been playing bass with them ever since, and now they have Steve Jordan on drums. So it doesn't particularly matter. And it reminds me of The Who a bit. You've got only two original members of The Who. You've got Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey, but the others are session musicians. So in which case, we could have The Beatles. Yeah. Theoretically, we could have Paul and Ringo and The Beatles back, but they won't do that because they've moved on and The Stones haven't moved on. It's part of their fascination. Uh, yes, of course it is. And um, obviously, you know, it's, it's a, a long history they've had. The, the famous rivalry with The Beatles, did it make The Stones better? that the Beatles were there? 
Definitely. Oh, yeah, because Andrew Lou Golden, the manager at the time, saw these fab, cuddly, sweet grandmas, love them, would have them round for tea, Beatles, and thought, right, we need to be the antithesis to them. And so the stones will be dishevelled and dirty and bad, and they will emphasise sex. And they will be um, the boys you would not want your daughter to bring home or go out with. And so they became objects of fascination. They, for they were they were edgier. They were cooler, I guess, a bit sexier than the Beatles. So, yeah. Um, also, would you not say that the Stones were better to rock out to than the Beatles? Mm, that's disregarding the fact that McCartney is actually the rock star of the Beatles. I think there's not a lot in it, really, is there? Mick likes to make fun and say, "Well, the Beatles haven't existed for years," but they have in everybody's minds. Living, living so when we go and see a gig like the Stones or McCartney, we're not actually seeing them as they are now. We're seeing them as they were then. And we're not hearing them as they are now. We're hearing the historical versions. Like when you re-watch a movie for the thousandth exactly. time. Um, and uh, and w w what about the emotional carnage uh, in relation to their partners, the wives, the girlfriends, the groupies? I mean, th these women were used, weren't they? In the early days, yes. I think Marianne Faithful, for example, was certainly used. Uh, the angel with big tits, she mm. was known as. And was That's, that used to be my nickname, but... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know how I you lost feel. Lost a bit of weight. But, um, yes, yeah, she was used because of the way she looked. Uh, she did have some musical talent. Anita Pallenberg actually created the Stones. They were a bunch of yobs when she picked them up in Germany, and she styled them and turned them into rock stars. Um, and the fallout for her was terrible late, much later on when she was a bit neglected by Keith living in America and took up with the gardener, Scott Cantrell, 17 years old, and he shot himself in her bed with Keith's gun. My goodness. And um, I think Keith's money got her out of that one. Look, it's the most fascinating read. It's winning rave reviews. What, what surprised you most when you were writing the book? I, you know, all this time I've been worried by the Bill Wyman, Mandy Smith scenario. I hadn't realised to what extent there was underage activity among other people there. Yeah, because, of course, he, he had a relationship with Mandy Smith when she was a young teenager. They eventually married. It was frowned upon at the time, but, of course, now it would get you... Uh, it would get you probably arrested. I don't it? think it was frowned upon. That's the worrying part, looking mm. back, that Mandy was sold as a role model to all young girls everywhere. Wow. And that wasn't an equal relationship. That was child abuse. Yeah. I mean, how old was she when... when do we know? Can we speculate how old she might have been when a relationship began? She says she was 14, but yeah. they met when she was 13, and I know that's true because I was there, but I didn't know how young she was. But I was drawn into that circle. I was hand-picked as one of Bill's close circle of friends to disguise the fact that he was having an affair with someone who was underage. And do you, would you say that you don't think that would be an isolated incident for members of, of the Stones? Definitely not. Mm. Young groupies? Yeah. Mm. I mean, do you, could there be a day of reckoning, a, a Me Too moment that, for the band? It's still coming, isn't it? I mean, rock and roll is largely untouched by that. Hollywood has fallen. Mm. Um, R. Kelly has gone to prison. Uh, there are other people in the frame. Uh, Lily Allen has spoken out about experiences that she's had. Mm. It requires somebody to make a formal complaint to the Crown Prosecution Service or to the Met Police. And until people go forward, until evidence is, um, is stacked up, they get away with it. As far as you're concerned, you, you, you couldn't rule out that the Stones were involved in underage sex, you know, uh, in their pomp. None of us could rule that out, no. Mm. Well, look, that's a revelation. There are many revelations in the book, beautifully written, thank and you. I can't wait to finish it. I, I can only thank you for coming in. We love having you on the show, talking about Lennon, David Bowie, Freddie, of course, and now Mick and the boys. Um, congratulations on the release of The Stone Age. 60 years of the Rolling Stones. It's out now. Quite the read. Uh, brilliant stuff. Lots more to get through next up in the news agenda with my panel. We've got lots of issues that I want to put to you. Should the government subsidise childcare? And are unisex toilets unfair on women? Also, we've got the papers hot off the press at exactly 10.30. See you shortly. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. At 
absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Oh, well, there we are. Let's, uh, let's get to some of your emails now, Mark, at gbnews.uk. And you've been very busy on email. Thank you so much for this. Um, so uh, we've got an email about the Rolling Stones from Damien. Mark, my father worked as a customs officer at Heathrow in the 60s. He was required to search Mick Jagger on his return to the UK. He likes to tell people that Jagger got a bit angry at being stop and searched. He calmed him down by telling him the only stones we're interested in are precious stones. Keep up the great shows, Damien. Well, thank you so much for that. In relation to Scotland, some great emails on this. Uh, how about this from Brian, who says, Mark, why should the whole of Britain have a vote in Scotland's future? Only the Scottish people should get to vote. No expats, immigrants or refugees who don't have to live here. Living in Scotland, we will have to put up with the consequences, says Brian. Jim says, Mark, last time the Scots had a referendum about leaving the UK, they bottled it. The UK had a referendum on leaving Europe and nailed it. If the Scots really want to leave, let the whole of the UK have a vote. There you go. Maureen says, dear Mark, as a Scottish lady living in England, I think every Scottish person in the UK should get a vote, not just those in Scotland. Love your programme. Keep up the good work. And last but not least on this... Kate says, dear Mark, Scotland should decide its own future. I voted for independence before and I will do it again. Kate, thank you for that. Well, it's exactly 10.30 and it's time for the papers. <laughs> and uh, let's have a look at our first newspaper, if we can. This is the Metro. Uh, let's flash it up. And uh, here is the headline, groping for answers. More trouble for Boris Johnson because, of course, we have the issue around this Tory MP former Deputy Chief Whip, Chris, uh, Chris Pincher, who is uh, facing significant questions in relation to his behaviour, actually earlier in the week at a private members club and possible previous for this kind of activity. So a big headache for Boris Johnson that's not going away. It has provoked my big opinion monologue, which you can catch up on Twitter at GB News. So uh, have a look at it if you missed the big opinion earlier in the show. Uh, next up, the Sun newspaper. Cliff horror in Turkey. Tawi stars death smash. A horrifying crash involving two Tawi stars, uh, Yasmin Oluhelu, uh, seriously hurt, and her boyfriend, Jake McLean, tragically killed. Their car careered off a cliff in Bodrum in Turkey yesterday. Uh, Jake dated uh, Tawi's Lauren Gudger before Yasmin. A source on the show said everyone is just stunned. Absolutely devastating there. The partner of a Taui star killed in a car crash in Turkey. Uh, what an absolutely appalling story. OK, the Daily Star next on a Monday morning. 
36 degree swelter belter. Happy scorch of July. A four week fry will make Britain hotter than Cancun by Saturday. Boffins and bookies reckon we could hit 36 degrees, making it the hottest ever July. Blimey. Jeanette, you're, you're sweating just at the thought of it. He'll burst. <laughs> I know. I think you're absolutely right. He will burst. Um, how about the Daily Telegraph now? Should we head there, Sebastian? Let's have a look at this one. Um, and uh, this is an interesting story. Of course, it's uh, in relation to Pincher as well. PM facing cabinet backlash over Pincher. Ministers express anger at being asked to defend the government over the latest sleaze crisis. Boris Johnson is facing a cabinet backlash over his handling of allegations against Chris Pincher, with ministers angry at being asked to defend the affair. Speaking to the Daily Telegraph last night, sources close to three cabinet ministers criticised the appointment of Mr Pincher as the deputy chief whip in the first place and expressed dismay at having to publicly answer questions about what Mr Johnson knew about claims of sexual impropriety. Unions will oppose increase in night flights. Plans to relax rules on night flights to help ease travel chaos over the summer holiday risk a fresh row with the unions. This, again, according to The Telegraph. OK, where should we go next? Uh, OK, that's uh, the papers for now. We'll get more of them as they come in. Full panel reaction from David Aldroyd Bolt, Jeanette Cranky and Ian Cranky. Uh, first of all, this terrible, tragic accident in, in Turkey. Mm. What an absolute nightmare, Jeanette. Yeah. yeah. We, we've travelled in Turkey back in the 60s when we used to... We went out there to entertain the American troops. Yeah. And uh, the roads are horrendous. Yeah. If you're off the main... I presume this would be off the main track. I mean, and, and the drivers, big trucks coming down, you could see them foot up on the wheel and small. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, I had my honeymoon in Turkey. Yeah, did you? Almost dying in a car crash uh -huh. wasn't the only exciting thing that happened that, that fortnight. <laughs> but yeah, the roads, the roads oh, are crazy. Yeah. And, and this will be a, a devastating blow uh, yeah. to, to, um, to, the, to the friends and family of uh, Jake McLean. Just starting his career as well, really, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, a shocking story for, for a Monday morning. And, uh, and, and how about this? Because people are desperate, Ian, to go on holiday. Mm -hmm. um, but plans to relax rules on night flights to help ease travel chaos are going to be blocked by the unions. The idea is there's such mm. a backlog of flights now yeah. that they could but... send people to Spain and France and Italy <laughs> and Portugal night. in the dead of night. But it looks like the unions will have this one scuppered. Yeah, although you've got to think also people are living near the, the airfields. The aerodromes, I should say. I guess so. Uh, those night flights might be an issue. Yeah. Um, Jeanette, we've got to do something mm -hmm. because we've been through two years of hell. Mm -hmm. People need a holiday. Aye, they do. You know, I mean, you, you guys like to travel. Yeah, yeah. Well, not um, this we've, year, we've travelled over life, so we're, we've, you know, never stopped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I just wonder, Jeanette, whether you wouldn't agree that the, the travel industry have taken an unnecessary hit in the course of this pandemic. You know, this attempt to yeah. like, stop flights, close borders, it hasn't, in my view, made a blind bit of difference to the virus. But no. it, it means yes. now that we don't really have an airline industry. They don't, haven't got enough staff. No. They're, they're, they're massively indebted. It's not good, is it? No. I mean, Michael O'Leary said that the era of low-cost travel is over. Finished. Mm. Well, we think? had just looked at it when we came up yes, um, the, yesterday. The, yesterday goes somewhere. And it was... I think it was Tenerife, I was, which is usually from Exeter about... Eighty-nine pound one way and yeah. maybe hundred. It was three hundred quid one way. Yeah. I mean, what? And that was October. Mm. I'm thinking this is crazy yeah. already. And Sonny was saying they paid uh, three hundred pounds to go to Mallorca. Uh. Oh, so I think well, it is over. Well, David, what do you think are the consequences of all of these uh, issues around travel? Because I mean, there's an economic impact too, isn't there? Mm. But I mean, I think there's mental health. I think there's a cultural advantage to travelling. All of this is at risk now. There's a cultural advantage, educational advantage, of course. But the, the big problem was that the air, airlines and, of course, uh, airports laid off so many staff during COVID for understandable reasons. Nobody yeah. was flying. Of course. Um, but they were paying way under the odds. I think this is where I have some slight, slight sympathy, maybe the only time you'll ever hear me say this, with the trade unions. Because yeah. those people do work vile hours. Yes. Um, are often very far from their families uh, and, you know, who'd want to do that? If you're going to pay them reasonably, that's fine. And I think if, if the unions do manage to, uh, in this instance, bargain for better pay, 
and for better conditions for staff uh, both within airlines and at airports, then there's no reason they shouldn't be flying during the night because people do need to get away. It's been... For many people, they, they won't have had a holiday since summer 2019. Yeah, that's, that's three right. years. Three years of the same skies and of mm. the same sights over and over again. You know, yeah. All work, all play it makes Jack a, Jack a very unhappy boy. Yeah. And I, I just don't think it's very reasonable, if the unions are blocking it uh, prima facie, I don't think it's very reasonable of them. If they're saying, you know, look, you need to improve conditions, then that's another matter. I, I wonder whether it's the dreaded C word as well, David, COVID, that... You know, people, we're still in an era where if someone gets a positive test for COVID, mm -hmm. they self-isolate mm. for a week or two. Yeah. Mm. Uh, whereas actually back in the day, if you got the flu, once you felt better, yeah. you went yeah. back to work. Yeah. It does surprise me quite how many people are still going on with the theatre of this. It's almost as though they can't now bear to let it go. It's like Stockholm Syndrome. They've been involved with it for so long, it's become such a part of their mental furniture that the idea of not having to test, the idea that if you had it, you might just you know, spend a couple of days at home and then get on with life as usual. It's, it's this curious thing that people can't seem to drag themselves away from the Covid theatre. Well, yes, including quite high-profile TV presenters that mm. do viral videos about how they're at death's door, yep. they're receiving the last rites, yep. A day later, they're doing TikTok dance videos. Yeah, yeah. Back in the studio by Friday. Yeah. You can if, make it up, Janelle. If you're one of these people with a nervous disposition, are you going to want to get on a very small aeroplane with a great many people and lots of recycled mm. air? Probably not. No. But this, it's about time that people in positions of power and influence within the travel industry well, said travel is that, safe. Isn't that the point, Ian, which is mm -hmm. that, you know, obviously, if you feel nervous about it, stay home. Yes. But please let the rest of us yeah. get cool. on with our lives, including older people yeah. who have been locked up for two years, exactly. many against their will, who do want to travel, yeah. don't want to be in a bubble for the rest of their no. lives. No, no. no. And, uh, as you say, old people like ourselves, 75 years old. Oh, of stop it. Look at you. <laughs> We've had four vaccines, so I'm perfectly happy to go anywhere. Yeah. You've never had so many drugs in your life, either. I know. Well, not since the 60s. Oh. <laughs> it's all coming out. There's an exclusive. So, by the way, do the crankies get a lot of attention when you travel? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, all over the nice. world. Are you are you known globally? No, in, um, in Australia and here. Exactly. We worked for 30 years in Australia. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> in the clubs, theatres, and, and we did mm. all the TV... Like the, the, the midday Newton, shows, the Bert Newton shows. and all the... W does the it shows. ever, Jeanette, does it ever get on your nerves, the attention? No, not really. No, I, I just accept it, you know. I'm when not... you're my height, you can't do anything about it. You can't hide it, you see. No, although, I, I mean, you're, 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 very, me. you're, you're very polite, <laughs> but is it, is, it a, is it... You can be honest, is it ever a drag? Because uh, Jeremy Clarkson said fame is pure hell. Uh, mm. Well, it, sometimes it is if you're in a hurry to do something, you know... Mm. And yet, yet. Or you're in a nice restaurant, see, and some guy pissed out his mind comes up. Yeah. Well, I, I, I loved you when you were... Oh, <laughs> excuse me, I'm afraid. Oh, God, what's the matter? You stuck up. Oh, no. That's you know. Thing. Yeah, you don't know. The minute you say, I'm sorry, we're eating, yeah. you become like a bad person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, look, uh, more trouble for the Prime Minister. It seems my big opinion monologue was prophetic, <laughs> David Oldroyd Bolt. And I noticed, as with last night, it's the Telegraph, which is normally quite Boris-friendly, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much a negative headline for the PM. Yeah. PM facing cabinet backlash over Pincher. I wonder whether the mood music around Boris, even from his supporters, is changing. Mm. It's understandable. I, I, the Telegraph has uh, been in a curious position over the past uh, couple of years in Ray Boris, and that there have been some columnists who are very much pro him, say Charles Moore, um, and then others who are adamantly against him uh, because he you know, failed the nation. Uh, they would say, so, say someone like Sherelle Jacobs. So it's a curious uh, dichotomy for them. But I think now that the edit, the, you know, they've got the front page saying this is a really terrible thing and his backbenchers are against him, mm. his cabinet is against him, it should make the Prime Minister either readdress um, how, how he assembles people around him or, frankly, just realise... He, he's incapable of it, which, well, yes, we, so which, just... which we know. He's yeah. incapable of reflecting on his behaviour and learning from it because, in his mind, he's done nothing wrong. He's world king. How could he possibly have done well, that's wrong? right. Listening to a mate of mine um, the other day uh, on the radio, the journalist uh, Kevin O'Sullivan, who had spent some time with Tory mm. MPs, and he said that mm. what they tell you privately is very different oh, yeah. from what mm. they're saying publicly. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so, And if that well of goodwill is not there for the PM, I, I bumped into a prominent Tory backbencher this afternoon. And again, I said, is it just, you know, is it game over now? He's like, yeah, it's, it's just if, not when. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The big problem, of course, for the Tories is that they can't decide who. 
Yeah. And that's the only reason <coughs> I think he survived the vote. It would have been Rishi until, until yeah. we found out his wife's a billionaire. Well, sorry. <laughs> so he proves himself to be a useless politician. I mean, you've got a rich wife. It can be a burden, <laughs> can't it, Ian? Yes. Uh, Jeanette's the one with the money, I'm told. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah she is. Yeah. I like that. Be careful with the pocketbook. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, you, are you like... You know Aretha Franklin, the incredible, amazing singer Aretha Franklin? She used to get ripped off by managers. So towards the end of her career, she would insist on being paid in cash. Oh. And she would have the cash in a clutch bag and she would walk on stage with the clutch bag really? you know, on the piano. She does a two-hour concert, <laughs> oh, goes off with the money. Yeah, we Good never did that, did we? You've not gone no, that far. I've problems with money. You've gone that far. But listen, uh, old Boris is, is definitely, um, yeah. you know, in trouble. I don't want this to be a Boris bashing no. fest. As I mentioned earlier, you know, he is our elected prime minister. Uh, but I just think now that... I, I, it seems like there is just this relentless stream of bad news, Ian. Mm. And I'm not sure I, I can see a way out for him. Mm. Well, the relentless bad press is, of course, coming from the press, isn't it? Mm. Let's see. I mean... It's true. The, the, the groping thing I, I, I find ridiculous because... If somebody started that with me, I would turn around and tell them to F off right away. No, yeah. you wouldn't. You'd would say, you, do um, that again. Would you give them a Glasgow <laughs> kiss? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> or would you would you set Jeanette Cranky on them? <laughs> yeah, I'd kick them in the legs and stand in the lumps. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Have, have uh, Jeanette, uh, you know, times have changed. You've been in show business for a good few decades. Mm. Uh, were you ever... Did you ever receive unwelcome attention like that when Ian wasn't around? Not really, no. I don't, don't, she wishes. I, <laughs> not really. No, no, no. We, the, uh, uh, the side of the show business we were all involved in was very close. Chummy and close. There wasn't, was it? Family, and, family yes. entertainment. Yeah, and, and, and we, we knew we knew that. most of the people that, that, that you know, the, the theatres the and the work people, and the people we worked with. If there was a lecture in it, a lecture, should say, he would be or she would be out in the neck in two minutes from the cast. Mm. You say, cut that out, or get out the bloody door. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the bottom line is, David, I think, listening to so many of my viewers, not all but some, that all Boris has to do to save his premiership is do everything Lord Frost has suggested, which is to cut taxes, mm -hmm. um, to sort out the Northern Ireland Protocol, to properly address the migrant crisis mm. uh, and to stimulate the economy, uh, to get rid of wokeism for it, from our institutions. Yep. Uh, that's, that is the Frost Manifesto. Yep. Yeah. If, if Boris Johnson does it, happy days. But the problem is, this is why I've done the monologue tonight, I now believe, in my heart of hearts, it ain't going to happen. I don't think it will happen because I don't think he really believes in a lot of it. And those people around him, particularly those people who are friends and allies of Mrs Johnson, don't believe in it. Mm. It won't be allowed to happen. So he's toast. I've had emails from my viewers earlier in the show saying yeah. they believe that Carrie Johnson is an influence on the Prime mm. Minister. Of course she is. She's his wife. Mm. It would be unusual if she weren't. Sherry Blair was an influence on Tony Blair. Yeah. Dennis yeah. Thatcher was an influence on Mrs Thatcher. That's an entirely usual part of being married. Mm. What I think is unusual in this situation is the degree to which Mrs Johnson seems to be able to dictate both policy and personnel. Mm. Well, there you go. Uh, lots more to get through in the programme. Uh, we're going to have a look at some more stories uh, including should the government subsidise childcare and are unisex toilets unfair on women? What do you think about going to a loo that's got men and women in it? Blimey. Well, it won't be at a branch of Halifax, but uh, it could be somewhere else. So we'll discuss that very shortly, plus another great British game show, more papers and more crankies. See you in two. We are GB News. We are right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today.
I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently, and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Finally, some good news for parents during these difficult times. Childcare costs could be cut down by £40 a week in a government bid to support hard-pressed families. The new plans are expected to be announced next week, which are aimed at reducing nursery fees and increasing the number of available childminders. The Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, aims to do that by relaxing rules on where they can work. On average, it costs £265 a week to look after a two-year-old. A lot of people don't have that money, so should the government be doing more should we be subsidising childcare? Something, Ian, that's very big in Scandinavia mm -hmm. and yeah. in other parts of Europe. And Scandinavian taxes are very high. They're very high, so I guess you get what you pay for. But, but people in Sweden, Finland, uh, Norway, uh, there's lots and lots of childcare so that mum and dad can go to work. Well, yeah, I would say the nursery schools are a great idea and should likely be... Um, subsidised by the government, but I can't see two-year-olds and one-year-olds. Well, I'm that's sorry, nursery I'm old, old schools. Fashioned. If you have a baby, I'm, you have a baby. It's nobody else's job, really, to look after those first few months, is it? No, for that, sure. That's what I feel. Well, well, yeah, so actually you'd be worried, actually, that if, if you... if the, if the the What do you think, David? If the, if the state sort of bankrolled childcare, it effectively orphans the generation of kids. It's, well, it's just another instance of people saying there is a problem, the state must solve it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't we think about taxing people less for instance, so that it's not such a massive burden on their post-tax income. Or even, here's a radical idea, we could try and decide as a society, was the mass influx of young mothers into the workplace a good thing societally? Has this been something that we might think about again? Because it's not just about the childcare, it's about the fact that to buy a house or a flat now, it's yes. predicated on a two-income family. Everything now is predicated upon the idea of everybody working all the time, and I don't think that's terribly good for children. To, to be born and to spend maybe six months with their mother and then straight away into someone else's hands. Mm, I don't think that that has a, a societally valuable outcome. That's right, so well, might, maybe mum's going to work not just because uh, she wants a career, but because otherwise they will go under. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we're babies of the 50s, well, 40s, actually. But, and I didn't know any other mother that worked, neither Jude. No. But, and, my, and Jeanette's father was in the mines, my, my father was in the electrical business. Yeah. So... I know things have got a lot dearer now, but maybe that's also where the families went. I've gone wrong. Well, yeah, and that's why inflation is such a worry, because it mm. will put more pressure on families, which means, uh, what do you do with the kids? Um, let's have a couple of uh, other papers which have come in. Are they ready, Sebastian? Um, can we uh, get to the papers very shortly? We'll, we'll get to uh, the uh, papers shortly, because I've got the uh, Mail, the Guardian and the Express. But first, separate toilets for men and women are going to be mandatory in all new public buildings. Oh. The government will formally announce plans which prevent non-residential buildings being constructed with only unisex toilets. Equalities oh. Minister Kemi Badenoch said it's important to provide these individual facilities and warned that some children were avoiding toilets at school because they're gender neutral. And with the discussions around safety, practical use, dignity and privacy, are these shared spaces fair on women? So it's a simple question, mm. David Aldroyd Bolt. Um, if, if you're in a public space, uh, do you have a men and a female toilet, male and female toilet, or do you go unisex? You have the male and the female toilet. It's a rare outbreak of common sense from government. I should have thought it's a simple matter of courtesy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's, uh, that, is, uh, that is obviously the million-dollar question. The issue is, Jeanette, I, I think many women are not happy with the idea of a unisex toilet. Imagine a public toilet. It's one in the morning. You've just come out of a nightclub. Yeah. You, you, do you feel safe going into a unisex toilet? Oh, no, well, you, you look under the seat and you think, <laughs> well, who the fuck's been there? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, although I, I'm not against it outdoors. 
say, on beaches and public places where it's wide open, mm. like they have abroad. But I don't think in buildings. Or... Well, I think that's where you're going in one at once, so you're not sharing the space. I think the, the real imposition for both sexes is having to share that space. Are with... we talking about being allowed into the same toilet at the same time? Well, into a, into a block, I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well... Well, 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 that is it. Um, let me bring you a couple of uh, headlines. And I'm just going to... Actually, I'll give you The Guardian. Sebastian's got that one up and running. Let's take a look at this. Um, and revealed children of lone parents hardest hit by era of Tory austerity. Half of the 3.1 million children of UK single parents now in poverty figures show. PM accused of failure to heed abuse warnings and several killed in Denmark gun attack, plus the legendary director that David mentioned just mm. earlier, Peter Brook, has sadly died, um, a true icon of uh, theatre and, uh, and the arts. Right. So there you go. A um, couple of other papers for you. I'm going to go old school, hold this one up for you. Police let 22,000 suspects roam three, free. Uh, concerning story there about major ineptitude of our cops. Fugitives accused of murder, rape and violence fail to attend court, but officers too busy to arrest them. Too busy doing what? Painting huh? rainbow cars and attending, <laughs> I don't know, woke marches. <laughs> uh, how about the Express now? I think uh, we've got this one. Let's have a look. <laughs> and it is a record fourth month <laughs> wait to buy a house. Absolutely shocking. Four months. Um, there you go. Buyers are having to wait four months as a broken system paralyses the housing market, experts have warned. Um, is it just my opinion or is everything just a bit broke right now? Yeah. Britain needs a reboot. It needs leadership. Who could that be, I wonder? Oh. Um, it's time now for the Great British Game Show and a certain fashion designer's new collection has hit the headlines for being ultra-sustainable. And as the Daily, Daily Mail put it, perfect for virtue-signalling stars. <laughs> Perhaps the star of the collection is a bag that used to identify as a mushroom before being turned into a bag that will retail at £2,000. That's right. It's remarkable. It's a two-grand bag. So we're going to play a game of whose bag is it anyway? First up, we have the ex-mushroom bag. Uh, whose bag is it? So who's the famous celebrity behind that bag? What do we think? Mm. She's a famous designer. Her dad is a legendary rocker. Oh, uh, McCartney. Stella, Stella McCartney. McCartney. OK, there she is. Let's have our next one. OK, whose box is that? Charles oh. the Exchequer. It is the Charles the Exchequer on budget day. OK, let's have a look at the next famous bag. What? Now, this guy is uh, was an influential figure at is number Dominic 10. Cummings? It is the Cummings' is rucksack, <laughs> full of Boris's secrets. Oh. <laughs> OK, uh, how about our next uh, icon? Whose bag is that? Uh, huh? That's a rather nice briefcase. Uh, uh, is it Paddington? He's an immigrant. It is Paddington Bear, all the way from Peru. Uh. OK, whose bag is this? Oh. This is tea. Oh, <laughs> good knowledge, David. Yeah. Absolutely right. Let's mm. have a look at the Iron Lady handbags. rocking yeah. her handbag. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> OK, next up, another legend of children's entertainment. Oh, well, that's Postman Pat. Yeah. It is Postman Pat. Well done, Ian. Nice job. Very good. OK, <laughs> how about this? Going a bit science fiction now. Children's fantasy. Oh, God, is that a bag? Uh, think J.K. Rowling. Oh, Potter. Oh. Hermione Granger. It's Hermione Granger's bag, which I believe was limitless and deep. Um, how about uh, our next bag? Which bag is this? Oh, um... Bag End. It's, it is it's Bag End. Bilbo Baggins. The home of Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> and last but not least, whose bag is this? Oh. All right. Go on, he go on. is a very funny comedian with a very elastic face. Oh. Silent comedy genius. M Mr Bean. It's Mr Bean. Well done, Ian. You're good at this. <laughs> That's Mr Bean's famous suitcase. Uh, well, look, I can only thank my amazing, amazing panel tonight. Uh, Jeanette, Ian and David, please come back soon. I couldn't thank do it you. without you. What an amazing audience you are. I'm back at nine o'clock on Friday. I can't wait for it. And stick around because I'm doing headliners next. Ah, thank you very much. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather and the UK is looking dry in southeastern parts to start off Monday, but there will be some showery rain elsewhere. Let's take a look at the details. Heading to the southwest first, and whilst there won't be as much rain as over the weekend, there could still be a few showers here first thing. In the southeast, it's looking fine and dry to start with. Some early sunny spells, the best of these towards Sussex and Kent. Across Wales, there will be some showers during the morning. They shouldn't be especially heavy though. It will be quite breezy here too. 
Showers are also expected around the West Midlands and Northwest England. The odd heavy one is possible and winds will be stronger than today, making it blustery, especially towards the coast. In the northeast of England, things should start mostly fine with some decent early sunshine here. However, cloud is going to spread in from the west as showers feed their way in during the morning. Towards Aberdeenshire and Edinburgh, Monday may get off to a dry start. Elsewhere across much of Scotland, it will be quite windy with heavy showery rain expected later on. It's a similar picture for Northern Ireland. The best of any dry weather will be in the southeastern areas, but showery rain will spread.